your Bibles, open them up to Romans chapter 8. We'll read verses 5 through 11, and then we will pray. Romans 8, 5 says this, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because a carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. I do pray that he would fill each and every one of us this morning as we would both hear and receive your word. Teach us about yourself, the power and the victory that you offer to every believer in Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Like many of you, I'm sure I'm a fan of Texas history, having lived in Texas most of my life. And uh, some of you may know that 184 years ago, next Sunday, February 23rd, the siege against the Alamo began. For 13 days, the Texian soldiers held up against massive odds from then the Mexican President General Santa Ana, and they were finally overrun March 6th, 1836. And the few survivors, of course, we know were executed, and it was a day of bloody victory for the general. Yet what seemed at first to be a massive defeat for Texas became a turning point. And you might know that the cry, Remember the Alamo, That was the rallying cry for independence at the later Battle of San Jacinto when Santa Ana signed an unconditional surrender after a very, very short battle. (laughs) War rarely ends in compromise. It happens sometimes, but the most decisive laying down of arms happens with complete defeat, unconditional surrender. And it isn't any different in the war against our flesh. The flesh and the spirit are completely opposed to one another, and although it may seem as if the flesh gains some victory for a time, we know in the end for a Christian, it is the spirit that gives total victory. And it's the power to conquer sin that comes from God. Of course, it comes from God, the spirit, and that's crucial for us to remember as Christians, because otherwise, we think, wrongly, that we've got the power to do all this on our own. Uh, We think we've got some reserve of internal strength when it comes that we face sin and temptation, and then we discover how powerless we are when we inevitably fail. Because we don't have the power to fight sin. God the Spirit does, and He is the one to empower us and to give us a victory. Now, all this is seen in Romans 8 as Paul continues writing about the Christian's ongoing struggle against sin. Remember, when we were unbelievers, the struggle didn't exist. Why? Because sin had complete dominion in our lives. But once we came to faith in Jesus, we surrendered our lives to him as our Lord and Savior. That's when we had a choice. That's when the battle began. And when he was writing from his own personal experience, Paul shared the testimony of his own war against the flesh. He did the things he hated while he didn't do the things that he wanted to do. And Paul's only hope was for a deliverer, was for him to be rescued. And he thanked God that he had a rescuer in Jesus. And it's because of Jesus that although we still struggle, and sometimes we do fail in our fight against sin, now there is therefore no condemnation for us as true Christians. Jesus took all of our penalty upon himself, and he did what we could not. Not only is there no penalty left for the believer, but now he's fulfilled the punishment that we deserved, and he both fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law on our behalf. And in writing of Jesus' work of fulfillment, Paul did give, though, as he closed out that section in Romans chapter 8, verse 4, one very specific qualification. All of this applies to what? To those who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Romans 8, 4, right? So that begs the question of what all this looks like. 
How can we know if we're walking in the flesh or if we're walking in the spirit? What happens if and when we fail? Have we somehow lost a spirit? Are these promises no longer ours? Well, Paul answers these questions and more as he writes of this ongoing war between our flesh and spirit, as well as the power and the victory that the spirit provides powerless to defeat our sinful flesh, but the Spirit of God is not. Jesus has given us the Holy Spirit by His grace, and He is the one who gives us victory and life. So we start by looking at the war in verses 5 through 8. This is a war. It shows here that we're powerless. Verse 5 says this, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. You know, if you're going to fight a war, the first thing you need to do is identify the various sides. If you don't know which soldiers are fighting for which army, it makes fighting really, really tough. And soldiers who have been in battle, and there's been guerrilla warfare going on, they know exactly what that's like. And Paul here identifies the sides, or more accurately, he teaches how his readers can identify which army, so to speak, that different people have sided with. There are those who live according to the flesh, and there are those who live according to the Spirit. Now, to be more precise, the words who live are not actually in the text. A, a literal rendering of the phrase might be, for those who are according to the flesh, are thinking or intent on the things of the flesh, but those according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. If you have a New American Standard, that's actually a very good translation of this phrase here. Uh, translators of the New King James, which I teach from the ESV and others, they rightly try to give this idea of a, a consistent form of thinking that carnal people live a certain way and spirit-led people live a different way, and I understand what they're trying to do, but even so, that might do a little bit of disservice to the text because it seems that Paul is describing the difference not just between carnal and spiritually mature Christians, because sometimes we can live carnally, but he's describing the difference between unbelievers and believers. While it's true that Christian believers sometimes make carnal, sinful choices, and we do temporarily think about the things of the flesh, that isn't our permanent dwelling place. The things of the flesh are not the Christian's ongoing lifestyle, even if they are occasional poor choices. So a literal rendering of this verse really brings out this idea better. Those who are of the flesh think of the things of the flesh, while those who are of the Spirit think on the things of the Spirit. You know, although uh, sometimes the actions of an individual person might sway between the two sides, one side or the other is the true reflection of who that person actually is. You know, a carnal person might sit among Christians in a church, but he or she is a false convert if the Holy Spirit of God is not with him in him or her. Likewise, a spirit-indwelled Christian sometimes engages the things of the flesh, but that's not who that person truly is. Who they are is someone different. A Christian is someone who's been born again, forgiven, has a living relationship with the living God through Jesus Christ. Before we go any further, i got to ask you, which one are you? Are you of the Spirit, or are you of the flesh? And the answer to this question is fundamental to our eternal salvation. Those who have been born of God the Spirit have the things of God the Spirit in their lives. Those who are not, have not. Those who have not been born again by the Spirit have not been made new creations. They do not have the seal of salvation. They do not have the fruit of the Spirit in their lives. And since they have none of that, why would anyone expect them to live according to the things of the Spirit? They don't have any of that. Why would anyone expect them to set their minds of the things of the Spirit? If godliness is not your desire, if giving honor to the Lord isn't on your radar, if the work of Jesus on your behalf is barely an afterthought to you, then you need to ask yourself some very serious questions. Who are you? What is your fundamental makeup? If everything in your life is fleshly, if it's carnal, if it's sinful, if it's self-centered rather than God-centered, then you have a pretty good indication that you are fleshly and not of the Spirit. You know, the Apostle John put it this way in his epistle, 1 John 2, 15 through 17, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Do you love the world or do you love God? And again, this doesn't speak of the occasional sin. It speaks of the ongoing attitude. Which do you most desire? One leads to death, the other leads to life, as Paul himself is going to write it in verse 6. 
You know, some people listening to this have a, a natural objection. They'll say, hold on, preacher, you're getting kind of drastic here. <laughs> it is drastic, but it might just serve as a life-saving wake-up call. In a war, things are between life and death. And you need to know which side you're on. And Paul takes time to identify the size for a reason because we want to be on the right side. You know, overall, there's nothing in the letter at this point that Paul is subtly accusing anyone specifically in Rome of anything. He just states the fact. He's not, you know, being passive aggressive here trying to name people without naming people. No, he just states the fact. Those who are of the flesh consistently and habitually set their mind on fleshly things. Those who are of the spirit do likewise with spiritual things. And for those who are true born again Christians, that idea should not cause any problems whatsoever. On the contrary, that thought ought to bring a lot of assurance. Because if your overarching desire is to see God glorified in your life and to love Him with all your heart and your soul and your strength through Jesus, then it's good to know that we are of the Spirit when we inevitably fail. Because we'll fall short, but you know what? I know I'm of the Spirit because I'm seeking these things. But for those who are false converts, you need to know that you're a false convert if you're ever going to change that. And the only way you can do that is if you look at yourself honestly. And if you can't be honest with yourself on the issue of eternal life, you can't be honest with yourself about anything. And there's no question more important to get right. And that's exactly the point Paul's going on to give in verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. If verse 5 defines the difference between the carnal man and the Christian, verse 6 looks at the end result of each state. Interestingly, when you're looking at this in the Greek, there are no verbs. No verbs. You know, one of the ways that ancient Greek is different from English is that sometimes words are assumed based on the grammatical form and the context. Same sort of thing can happen in Hebrew. In this case, the verse literally reads, For the mindset or the mentality of the flesh, death. But the mindset, mentality of the spirit, life and peace. Pretty dramatic way of saying it. Pretty drastic way of saying it. And again, it is drastic choice. It's between life and death. What Paul seems to be describing is this end result of an overall worldview, the inevitable consequence of a line of thinking, because, you know, everybody has a worldview. They have a, a lens through which they see life. They interpret the things of life, how they interact with life. And in this case, we can look at things spiritually, biblically, or we can look at things carnally, sinfully. And whatever worldview we have leads to a certain consequence. It's like following a map. If you want to get to a certain destination, you've got to follow a certain route. You'll never get to Disney World in Florida if you head west towards New Mexico. Right? Now, you can travel in the nicest car. You can listen to great tunes along the way. You can even stop people and, and you know, help them along on their own journeys. But you'll never get to where you intended to go in the first place. People do the same thing in life. They say they want to go to heaven, but they head in the direction of hell. It doesn't matter how much they enjoy the journey or how nice to people they are along the way. If they don't go to God the way God invites us to go, then we won't go to him at all. And of course, we know Jesus is the only way. See, this is the difference between the carnal mind and the spiritual mind. The end result, or the, the destination, we might say, of fleshly thinking is death. The end result, the destination of spiritual mindedness is life and peace. And how can that be otherwise? You know, it only makes sense that fleshly stuff leads to death. When Adam and Eve, they were in the Garden of Eden, they encountered this exact thing. It was carnal thinking that led to their spiritual destruction, right? Satan told Eve, number one, he said, God's wrong. And second, he said, you know, you'll have everything you want through this single act of disobedience. Satan told Eve that if she was selfish just this one time, she'd be like God, inferring, you know, you don't need God to be made perfect. That's the very essence of carnal mindedness, carnal thinking. We think that if we sin, we'll get everything we want. You know, no matter what God has already said on the issue, we'll get everything we want. You know, God just wants to keep us from our own self-satisfaction anyway. We get what we want, when we want it, God just gets in the way. So we cast him aside to satisfy ourselves. That's carnal thinking. And what happens? Death. Just like God warned Adam and Eve, you shall surely die. They quickly learned, as Paul wrote in Romans 6.23, that the wages of sin is death. Their spiritual natures instantly died in that moment that was passed on to us as their descendants. We'll talk a little bit about that a little later on as well. And instead of learning from their example, guess what? We learn the exact same lesson the hard way. 
We sin our own sins against God. We experience the consequence of death in our lives. We live in our nature of death. We experience death of opportunities that we have with God. We have death of relationships. We surround ourselves with the stuff of rot and decay. But contrast that, right? Praise God that isn't what comes to a Christian. Praise God that we have a rescuer that delivers us from this body of death, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of what Jesus has done to us, for us, and within us, now we have a new nature, a new mind. Now we have a new worldview, so we have a new map, a new destination, one that leads to life and peace. And when you consider the difference, those two things, you know, uh, of those two ends and destinations cannot be more extremely opposed. Those who are of the flesh reap death. Those who are of the spirit reap life and peace peace. And that peace is important, isn't it? Death, contrary to popular opinion, death is not peaceful. Now, it appears to be peaceful because the body's no longer moving, no longer doing anything. So there's no obvious suffering, no breathing, no anything because there's no life. But do not make the mistake of thinking that death for the unbelieving carnal person is peaceful. It is not. The Bible tells us that it's appointed for people to die and then face the judgment. And the judgment described by the Lord Jesus for unbelievers is not peaceful. It's a place of outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a place where the worm never dies and the fire's never quenched. And I don't say this with glee. I don't say this with sadistic pride. I have loved ones who currently face this judgment. I say this because it's the truth. And those who die in their sins cannot rest in peace like so many people want to think. It's only the Christian believer who has true peace in death. Only the Christian dies physically, then enters immediately into eternal life and experiences forever peace with God. And it's such a joy for those who are there. Christians experience a peace that is unknown in this life. And then they're forever free from suffering, not only physical suffering, but also mental, emotional, spiritual suffering, whatever. Christians experience eternal peace away from this war against sin as we're ushered into the very presence of God, glorified together with our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what John saw in his revelation of Jesus towards the end of the book, Revelation 21, 3 and 4. I heard a great voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself will be with them and he be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There should be no more pain for the former things have passed away. Beloved, that is the promise that awaits us as a born-again believer in Jesus Christ. And that is a good, good thing. That is the eternal life for which we long. That's a peace of which we're assured. This is what we have in Jesus and it's proven out through our spiritual mindedness. Now to this, some people ask, why is this difference so drastic? Why is it so stark? Why is it that carnal people inherit only death and spiritual people alone inherit life and peace? And just as a reminder, before we go too far in that, it's not like Christians are perfect and never act according to our carnal natures. Even Paul understood that he was sometimes carnal. We saw that in chapter 7, verse 14. Paul's fight against his own carnal nature was exactly why he needed the rescue of a deliverer, the Lord Jesus. But that's a different situation than what Paul's writing about right here. See, what we saw last week, Romans 8, 1 through 4, Paul wrote of Christians, right? He said, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are, what? In Christ Jesus. Speaking of Christians. In verses 5 through 8, Paul's primarily describing what happens to those who are not in Christ. He never once tries to excuse away his own occasional carnality and sin. In fact, he freely admits it's sinful. It's deserving of condemnation. We just don't receive the condemnation because of Jesus, right? Because of grace. In verses 5 through 8, he writes of the death that awaits the truly carnal person and that ongoing war against that person and God himself. And this is why the difference is so drastic. The spirit-born, spiritually-minded person desires to be submitted unto God even while stumbling and struggling with sin. The fleshly person, the carnal person, has no such desire, freely engaging sin even while occasionally stumbling into something nice towards others. The carnal person is actively, fully opposed to God, and that's shown through his or her mind. And Paul goes on to make that point. Look at verse 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. 
For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. There's war going on here. What we're going to see here in verses 7 and 8, Paul lists two impossibilities. Two impossibilities. The first is this. The impossibility of the flesh submitting to God. Fleshly mindedness is always, always hostile towards God. The sinful carnal mind does not subject itself to the law of God because by definition, it is rebellious against the law of God. If someone's mind was submitted to the law of God, then that person would see the sinfulness of his or her sin. They'd repent of it, cast him or herself on the mercies of Jesus for forgiveness. But that's not what a carnal mind does. By definition, a carnal mind works against the will of God and so it will always be in rebellion against God. And that leads to the second impossibility, verse 8. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So the second impossibility is the impossibility of the flesh ever pleasing God. Fleshly works and mindsets, they never submit themselves to God, so they will never accommodate the will of God. They will never win His favor or His grace. There is but one way into the favor of Almighty God, that's through humble faith, and his son Jesus. And as the scripture says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Again, by definition, the flesh is proud because it inherently asserts itself over God. So the flesh is always rebellious. It cannot please God. Now, what this means for the person who hasn't surrendered to Jesus in faith is that he or she will never, ever find a way around Christ. That person will never be able to justify him or herself to God, will never be able to enter eternal life should things remain the same. As long as that person remains in his or her carnal flesh, that person remains in constant rebellion and war against God. Thankfully, that can change, but only through humil humility, repentance, and faith in Christ Jesus. All right, guys, so that's the war. Battle lines are drawn between flesh and spirit. The sides are clear. Those who constantly have their minds fixed on fleshly, sinful things show that they are flesh and sin. This inherently leads to death because there's an impossibility of that fleshly mind submitting itself to God and pleasing God. Of course, the contrast is that of the spirit. Those who are born of the spirit have the mind of the spirit that leads to life and peace. You say, okay, that's a ton of information, but it might not be clear how this all applies. After all, at this point in the book of Romans, Paul's been writing of the battle between the flesh and the spirit and the lives of believers, right? Because he's writing to believers of the church of Rome. And then all of a sudden, he takes his turn into writing about unbelievers and the impossibility of their current unchanged, unrepentant mindset being reconciled with God. So how does that help us, right? How does that help us in our own struggles? How does that help us deal with sin? Simple. It defines the war is what it does. It draws clear lines in the sand so that we know what mindset belongs to God and what does not. It's often said by a former boss of mine that a problem well-defined is half-solved. If we're going to fight against the occasional carnal sin in our lives, then we need to be able to define those things from God's point of view. Uh, so we don't look at a, a sudden outburst of rage one day and just write it off, oh, it's just no big deal. No, that came from a mindset of the flesh. That's something that's inherently opposed to God. Uh, we don't excuse a lingering look of lust as something, you know, that's just what all men do. Boys are going to be boys. Or sometimes, let's be honest, women are going to be women. No, because that's the act of someone who's an enemy of God, right? right. Not treating God as our Lord. By getting the definitions right, we get the situation right, that leads us to the right solution. Think of it in terms of medicine. If you deal with ongoing headaches and you continue to treat it with aspirin, you might deal with a little bit of symptom, but you might be missing the root cause and the bigger issue. They go, well, that's no big deal. Everybody gets headaches. But then, you know, your doctor notices something, he orders a PET scan, finds out you've got brain tumors. All of a sudden, that little bitty aspirin pill doesn't do a whole heck of a lot of good, does it? What changed? You finally got a real definition, which showed you the real situation, and that leads you to a real solution or a treatment. When it comes to the sin in the life of a born-again believer, we've got to see these things rightly if we're going to deal with them appropriately. And once we define it as a war with unrelenting enemies rather than no big deal, now we can move forward with a strategy for victory. Guess what? We've got a strategy for victory starting in verses 9 through 11. God gives us power through the Spirit. Verse 9 says this, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. 
The first thing Paul does and makes clear in verse 9 is that he returns to writing to, he's writing of, born-again Christians, right? Verses 1 through 4, he wrote of Christians. Verse 5 through 8, he wrote of carnal, primarily carnal non-believers. Now he writes of Christians again. You know, it's the you of the Romans, and we're first person we're reading it today. We, right, us today. We are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. How could Paul be so sure that we're not of the spirit, or we're not of the flesh, but of the spirit? How could he be sure of that? Because we've all engaged in carnal sin. None of us are immune from that. We know that. Not even Paul. All of us deal with this carnal nature that remains with us. And even Paul freely acknowledged that, you know, sin dwells with me, dwells in me. Romans chapter 7, verse 20. So if that's the case, how can anyone at all ever be certain that he or she is of the spirit rather than of the flesh? Because we want to make that clear. How can anyone know? Fortunately, it can be crystal clear. Paul tells us, he says, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. If you have the Holy Spirit, you are of the Holy Spirit. Very clear. If you have the Holy Spirit, you're of the Holy Spirit. If God himself indwells your life, your heart, the temple of your body, however you want to say it, then God himself is your proof of salvation. God the Holy Spirit is himself the personal evidence that you've been born again and you now belong to God as one as his own. Now, please do not gloss over this. Every single born-again Christian has the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a lot of Christians that get confused on this point, and some churches that unfortunately teach, you know, some Christians have the Spirit, others do not. The Bible could not be clearer on this point. Look again at what Paul wrote at the end of this verse. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. If someone does not have the Holy Spirit, that person is not a Christian, period. A spiritless Christian is not a Christian at all. A person only becomes a Christian when he or she is born again of the Holy Spirit. Regenerate John chapter 3, verse 5, born of water and the Spirit. No one can see the kingdom of God without that. The Holy Spirit is our seal, our guarantee of salvation, as Paul goes on to write to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 1.22. To say that a person can be a Christian and not have the Holy Spirit is to speak contrary to biblical doctrine. Now, where the confusion rises is in the various ministries of the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit, gives us our new birth and dwells our lives as our seal of salvation. And in addition to those things, he also empowers us to live as witnesses for Christ. Now, it is possible for a Christian to experience the first two ministries without consistently experiencing the third, right? You can be regenerated and dwelt without being consistently empowered, but it's not possible for a Christian to experience the first, but not the second. If you're born of the Spirit, you're going to be indwelt by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit immediately comes into the life of a believer at his or her salvation, which, by the way, was seen in the lives of the disciples when Jesus breathed on them one week after his resurrection, with still several weeks to go until the day of Pentecost. You read about that in John 20, verse 22. But what the believer does with God the Spirit at that point does vary from person to person. Some Christians do live in constant dependence on him, asking to be filled with the Holy Spirit and be used by him for God's glory. And by the way, we're commanded to do that very thing. Ephesians chapter 5, 18. Other Christians, let's be honest, they don't give the Holy Spirit a second thought. They attempt to live in their own strength. The work of empowerment by the Spirit is, you know, it is indeed an additional work of the Spirit beyond our initial salvation. People want to classify, oh, you're talking about a second work. Well, let's talk about second, third, fourth, fifth, whatever. Daily work in the life of the believer, yes, hopefully it happens often, every day, received by faith. Now, Paul is going to write more about the power the Spirit provides in verse 11, but for now, the point is that every Christian has the Spirit. It's just that different Christians interact with the Holy Spirit differently. Now, before moving on, another huge bit of theology we don't want to miss. Don't miss the declaration by Paul of Jesus' deity. And the first part, the Holy Spirit, is what called the Spirit of God. And the latter part of the verse, he's called the Spirit of Christ. Now, if you have a mind towards mathematics, and it took me a very long time in my schooling to actually enjoy math, which made me kind of weird from that point on. But I did get to a point where I enjoyed math. There was one thing, though, that really did click with me earlier on, and that was the geometric proofs, you know, where you could logically walk through certain proofs. I couldn't 
recreate a single one of those things for you today, but this makes sense to me, all right? So let's think about what Paul says there. He says, oh, ignore that letter there, but the Spirit of God is the Spirit of Christ, right? That's made clear. Mathematically, you can just switch that around, can't you? The Spirit of Christ is the Spirit of God. Makes sense. If one's on one side of the equal sign, then you can flip around. Well, then if you drop the Spirit there, then what do you have? Christ equals God. This is a definitive statement of Jesus' deity. Jesus is God, demonstrated by the fact that the Holy Spirit belongs to both God the Father and belongs to God the Son. Now, Paul uses the, the person of God and Christ interchangeably here, not because he's confusing them, but because Jesus Christ is fully an equal God. The Son is not less powerful than the Father, he is not less important than his Father. The Son is truly God. Now, although the concept of the Trinity gets into some deep waters, they are important waters to get right. Because we're speaking about the nature of God himself. And we want to make sure that the God we worship is the true God. And the only way we can do that is by worshiping God as he has revealed himself to us. And he's revealed himself to us in his scriptures. Now, granted, some of those things might be deep and perhaps difficult to understand, but they ought to be if we're speaking about the infinite God in finite terms. Here's the key when you come to deep issues like this. Faith. Believe the Bible for what it says, even if you can't wrap your minds fully around it. The Bible says that there's one God. The Bible says that the Father, Son, and Spirit is God. That's okay. The Bible says it, we believe it, and guess what? We've got an eternity with Jesus for him to teach it to us, for us to understand it. Faith isn't just the key to understanding deep truths like the Trinity and the deity of Christ, by the way. It's also the key to our salvation. When we have the Spirit of Christ, we're made Christ's people, being those who are of the Spirit. But the only way any of that happens is if we have faith in Jesus to start with. So hopefully you have believed, and if not, Today, you can. You can put your faith and trust in Jesus as Lord. Okay, so we're given the Spirit, and Paul writes then of two amazing things, two amazing gifts that the Spirit gives us as he looks at this victory that we have in this battle against sin. Verse 10, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit of, is life because of righteousness. Gift number one is life. We have life through the Spirit. Now, remember that before we place our faith in Jesus, we're spiritually dead. And again, this, you know, uh, this is what we talked about earlier. We're talking about what was passed down to us through the generations through Adam. And you might recall in our study in the book of Romans, Paul actually wrote quite a bit about this in Romans chapter 5. And he said in Romans 5, 12, through, death, through one man, sin entered the world, death through sin, thus death spread to all men because all sinned. When Adam sinned, he spiritually died, and he immediately, at that moment, required the grace of God. But his fallen nature was passed down to every single human being that followed. We're born with a dead, fallen, spiritual nature. Well, how is that reversed? Only through the work of the Spirit. This takes us back to the idea of regeneration. The fact we've got to be born again through faith in Christ. And at that moment, we put our faith in Him, then the Spirit gives us a New birth. We become new creations of Christ. Everything's brand new. Praise God. We have life. Well, how does that relate then back here in Romans chapter 8? Well, look back at verse 6. Compare. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. What was the destiny of the carnal person? Death. What's the destiny of those who are of the Spirit? Life. See, now that we've been imputed with Christ's righteousness through faith, now that the Spirit of Christ is in us, seeing that Christ himself is in us through his spirit, now we have the guaranteed gift of life. Hey, great news. I didn't know. I've got, I've got eternal life promised me in the future. I know I got that promise through the spirit. I sing about that all the time. Praise God for that. That's wonderful. But tell me, how does that help me in my current war against sin? I'm glad that's in the future, but what about right now? Paul's about to bring it all home. We don't just have life in the future. We have life right now. Look at verse 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Gift number two is power. We have power through the spirit to live this life. 
Now, although we do have to wait until heaven to be free from the presence of sin all around us, we don't have to wait till heaven to be free from the grip of sin right now. We have freedom from that right now through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit gives us life. What kind of life is that? It's the life of the Spirit of the God who raised Jesus from the dead. God gives resurrection power to born-again believers through the Holy Spirit to kill sin. By ourselves, we can't do it. By ourselves, we're Christians living in our own power, trying to. And we're in the same position of Paul back at the end of Romans chapter 7. We do the things we hate. We don't do the things we want. We're wretched sinners chained to a body of death, crying out to a rescuer. That's what we're trying to do in our own power. Praise God, we have a deliverer. How does Jesus deliver us? Through the Holy Spirit. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples right before he ascended into heaven? Acts 1.8, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. What was it that Jesus promised his disciples through the Spirit? Power. What was it that they most needed? Power. Think of it. At that time, they didn't need knowledge. They had all the knowledge they needed. They already saw that Jesus was the Son of God, crucified for their sins, risen from the grave. They already had faith in Him. They had that. Their hope was in Him. They even already had the regeneration they needed because by this point, Jesus had already breathed on them weeks ago. So they had received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So what stopped them from going out and telling everybody already about Jesus as they just get started and kick off the Great Commission? They lacked power. The ministry of the Spirit had not yet begun and would not happen until he came upon them with tongues of fire in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. What is it that we need to be witnesses of Jesus? Power. What is it that we need to just live for Jesus? Power. Who gives it? God the Holy Spirit. Guys, when armies go to war, they go armed. When fighters enter the ring, they go into the octagon. They get fueled. They get fired up. Why then, when Christians go into battle, when we would want to go on our natural weaknesses. Why do we think we can do this on our own? As if we could just say no to temptation by an act of our internal will. I'll just pull myself up by my bootstraps this time. This time I'm going to stand tough. This time I'm not going to let sin get to me. It's been often said that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. And if that definition holds true, and there's a lot of Christians out there who've been in crazy land, <laughs> myself included. We go to battle on our own power and we fail. And then we try it again and we fail. This time it's going to work, then I fail. And then we finally cry out in our desperation, who's going to deliver me from this body of death? And the response from Jesus, I thought you'd never ask. Beloved, if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then that same Holy Spirit will give you power to defeat sin. He'll give life to your mortal body as He gives power to your powerless body, and you can experience victory over the sin in your life. You know, before we close it out here, interestingly, the, the word Paul uses for mortal is different than the word that he uses for flesh. That's interesting. And it tells us something important. A fleshly nature need not rule our mortal bodies. Just because we live in physical flesh doesn't mean that we have to be ruled by carnal, sinful flesh. We don't have to give in to the stuff that surrounds us. We don't have to heed the siren call of temptation and resign ourselves to falling victim in the war against personal sin, not by a long shot. The Spirit gives life to our mortal bodies, and we have God-given resurrection power to live that life right now. See, this is where the rubber meets the road. I've yet to meet a Christian who really wants to fall in temptation. Wake up in the morning, I can't wait to fall today. We all do it, but none of us likes doing it. We've all fallen. We're all too familiar with the taste of defeat against personal sin. We've all felt powerless, but because of Jesus, we are not powerless. God, the Holy Spirit, is in us. He gives us life and power. He gives us victory. And this isn't theoretical. This isn't something that just applies to some you know, really super spiritual Christians over there, but not every Christian. This is something that applies to every single one of us. Look again, if you would, just real quick over verses 11, and notice, and you might even circle them, notice the ifs that are there. 
in each verse. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, if Christ is in you, if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, all those ifs are conditional in the sense that Paul's writing on the condition of Christianity. You've got to believe in Christ. The promise of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit again, believe it. With that in mind, the promise of the indwelling Spirit of God is a guaranteed promise. The if in the Greek is what's called a first-class condition, meaning that its condition and its accompanying statement is assumed true. You could almost just as easily say, since the Spirit of God dwells in you, you are Christ's. Because Christ is in you, you have the Spirit of life, and on and on. There's no doubt that the Holy Spirit of God dwells in those who belong to Jesus, for we would not belong to Jesus if he did not graciously give us a spirit. And what this tells us is that there is zero Christians with no access to spiritual power. There is no Christian that need fall to temptation. We often do, but that's when we rely on ourselves. That's when we go into the battle unarmed. Arm yourself. Go in the power of the Spirit because he gives us victory. Guys, in our war against sin, we're powerless in ourselves, but we have mighty power and victory through the Holy Spirit. The lines have been drawn. It's clear. It's uncompromising. We need to remember which side we're on and live like it. It seems like a lot of Christians, they forget what uniform they wear. You know, we don't live like our lives depend on Jesus' grace, and we walk into the battle unarmed and eventually find ourselves acting as if we're on the other side. How many times have we seen professed Christians acting just like the unsaved world. How many times have we been, you don't have to raise your hand, I'll raise my hand, been that same Christian? Beloved, let's be real with ourselves. When we engage in repeated sin, we're acting like those who are at enmity against God. We're acting as if we're still at war against our Heavenly Father we're fighting on the wrong side of the battle line, so we need to stop it. See our actions for what they are, repent, and come back to the mercies of Christ. But for those times that we've unintentionally fallen, those times that we've stumbled into sin, not knowing how we can have victory over it, then we have the sure promise in Jesus. We've got the Holy Spirit. We never need to walk into the battle unarmed. The power of the one who raised Jesus from the dead is in us. Think of that. Could anything stop Jesus from getting out of that tomb? Could any rock be so big that it holds him back from rising? Does death have any hold on him? No, the resurrection power possessed by Jesus burst the bonds of the grave, destroyed the sting of death, and that exact same power is available to us through the Holy Spirit who indwells us at this very moment. So, beloved, when was the last time you asked the Spirit to renew you by his power? When was the last time you asked God the Father to fill you with the Spirit? It's like the old chili commercial. If it's been more than a few minutes, it's been too long. We don't just need the Spirit occasionally. We need Him and His power constantly. Now, He never leaves us. But like all sheep, our attention wanders too easily. Our dependence upon Him wanes. So you go to God today in the name of Jesus, asking for a renewed filling of the Holy Spirit and on the authority of Scripture, I say there's zero doubt that he will give. Why is that? Jesus' words in Luke eleven thirteen: 13, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And if that's true of the Spirit's power that's available to the born-again Christian, surely it's just as true of the Spirit's birth to those who are not yet Christians. If you see your need to be saved from that carnal nature of sin, if you understand that what awaits you is eternal death and you would prefer and want and desire to enter into eternal life, if you understand that your only hope is Jesus Christ, then you need to call upon him today to be saved. And you can do that right now as we pray. Father, thank you so much that you do give the Holy Spirit to those who ask and those who desire to be saved by Jesus in your grace, Father, you do save through Jesus because Jesus died for the world and anyone who calls upon him can be saved. So Lord, any among us today who have not yet done that, let this be the moment they do so. Let them see Jesus for who he is, the Son of God who died for them at the cross, rose from the grave, 
And in this moment, let them cast themselves on Jesus. Say, please save me. Please forgive me my sins. Please be my Lord. I surrender to you. Give them the words they need to entrust themselves to Christ. And because Jesus is faithful, save them, Lord. For all of us, we pray for a renewed filling of your spirit. We don't want to walk into the battle unarmed again, as we've done so many other times. Give us your grace as you fill us with your spirit, with power, that we might live as faithful witnesses of you to this world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.